oh, wow, it is so good to see people. <laughs> Amen. It is so good. To, Karen, I've been walking around just seeing old friends, and I've missed it. I don't know if you've missed it, but I've missed seeing you folks. And it is wonderful to be able to get together. I want to welcome our friends who are watching on 3ABN and maybe some other internet sites. And it is good to come together and talk about the most important thing, which is Jesus. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to open God's Word with you. And tonight we're going to be sharing a little bit about uh, the three angels' message, the gospel in flight. I'm going to sort of be giving you a... um, a 30,000 foot view of the three angels message and maybe before I get to that uh, I asked Stephen's permission earlier and we're all here talking about what can we do to get the message out before Jesus comes and we're really excited to let you know that amazing facts and 3ABN will be working together this fall we're going to be doing an evangelistic program a full series like we did back in net 99 it's called panorama of prophecy And every church, whether you meet in your home or you meet in a church, any individual, you can come by the Amazing Facts booth, find out more about that. We want to get everyone involved. There's brand new lessons and tools to uh, share the gospel. That's going to be October 15 through November 13, and there'll be dual broadcast, Panorama of Prophecy. Please pray about that. I think that uh, the time right now is ripe for getting the message out. What do you think? Now, we're going to be talking a little bit about the the three angels' message, and I'll be honest with you, um, when I first started attending the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and I'd go to the various Adventist churches, you know, first church I went to was Palm Springs, and I think I saw it there, and they went to other churches, and I thought, they've all got the same ball outside with three angels around it. And I thought, what's with that? And then as I'd sit in on different Adventist Sabbath schools and messages, I'd hear them refer to the three angels' message. And and I remember reading something about it when I read the great controversy up in the cave, but I didn't know what a big part of the message it was. And I'll be honest with you, when I first joined the church, I thought, these folks seem to fixate an awful lot on a few verses in Revelation. But as the years have gone by and I've studied it, I understand why. It it is really one of the most important things that we can be sharing. It's what you would call present truth. You know, Peter talks in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12 about present truth. You know, back in Noah's day, present truth was there's a flood coming. Get on the ark. That's not our message today. It was the message then. Uh, Jeremiah had a message, surrender to Babylon. That was a prophetic message in Jeremiah's day. I know it's hard for you and I to picture that God would tell people to surrender to Babylon. That was obviously present truth for them then. And John the Baptist, of course, his message was prepare for the Messiah's first coming. And you and I have a different message now. The three angels' message is the message for today. Maybe before we get into that, I'll give you a little amazing fact. Don't ask me why, but I like amazing facts. I was fascinated last month to see that you can now go to space. Anybody can go to space. And I'm so excited about that because I love flying. I've always had a dream that I would somehow, I'd fantasize, I'd be invited. The president would call and say, you know, we've had teachers in space and scientists, we want a preacher. (laughs) And uh, they would describe exactly what my qualifications are and I would be the first pastor in space. And so I was intrigued when I saw last month that uh, a couple of billionaires fulfilled their dream of going to space. You probably heard about that. Richard Branson, the uh, owner of Virgin Air, in uh, July, he went up into suborbital space. And then Jeff Bezo of Amazon, he took um, his rocket ship that he built. Don't you wish he could build your own rocket ship? The blue origin, origin, and uh, he went into suborbital space, and they said they're now opening this up to the public. Uh, someone was wanting to know how much one of Bezos' tickets would be, and someone bought one that was auctioned for $28 million. 
That's for 20 minutes in space. You know, I was thinking of developing a GoFundMe account that you might help me. <laughs> I, really, I really have this dream. <laughs> but wait, Branson's having a sale. It's only $200,000 per ticket. And of course, Elon Musk, he's got his rocket ship company, SpaceX, but they're not dealing with suborbital space. He's going all the way to the International Space Station. That's really where I'd like to go. Musk is not so much interested in taking a trip just to suborbital space. He says he wants to die on Mars. Really, that's his dream. He's three billionaires reaching for the sky. Maybe that's not the best analogy to talk about the three angels. But uh, it's all I had. <laughs> you know, I think before I dive into this, it would be a good idea to just read it together. If you have Bibles, I'd like to invite you to go with me to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. And we'll start with verse 6. Of course, you read in Revela Revelation chapter 7 introduces the 144,000 and the seal of God. Revelation 14 says they have their father's name in their forehead. And after it describes this group, then you go to verse 6. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him who made heaven and earth and sea and springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. And he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Why is this passage so important? Why is it considered present truth? Because you read the next verses and it pictures Jesus coming in the clouds to harvest the earth. It's the ultimate judgment. And so this is the message, or I should say these are the messages that go to the world immediately before Jesus comes. Now notice what's happening here. When you go to Revelation chapter 13, you've got a picture of the beast and he's saying all, all nations, all tongues, rich, poor, free, bond, must worship the beast, receive the mark of the beast. And so Revelation 14 is contrasting that message. Back in chapter 13, there is judgment that the beast executes on those who do not worship the beast in his image and receive his mark. Cannot buy or sell ultimately to be killed. Then God gives a positive side in the next chapter. He says, there's a mark that I have and there's a judgment on those who worship the beast and receive his mark. So friends, you notice that between chapter 13 and chapter 14, there's no Switzerland. What I mean is there's no neutral territory. Everybody here in the future, perhaps near future, is going to be receiving one of two marks. One of those, the seal of God, eternal life. One of them, it's the most fearful declaration and pronunciation that you find in the Bible. Always strikes me as uh, odd. Sometimes people say, Pastor Doug, I, I like Jesus in the New Testament. It's full of love and grace, but the Old Testament has got plagues and wrath. I said, you haven't read Revelation. There's a lot of plagues in Revelation. Chapter 14 tells us that those who receive the mark, then you got chapter 15 and 16, the seven last plagues. Are falling. This is the most ominous warning that can be given to the world. So you see here in Revelation chapter 14, you've got a message of worship, witness, warning, and wrath. There's a judgment that is coming. 
It represents the greatest climax of history, which is, of course, the second coming. It's got the, the greatest message in history, which is the everlasting gospel. And it's the greatest warning in history against those who worship the beast and his image. If you can find anything more important than that, let me know what it is. That's why this is present truth that needs to go to the world. I think it's interesting that when you read in, um, in Revelation chapter 14, it talks about the second angel's message. It says that message is originally given. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. But it doesn't say with a loud voice. The first angel's message, loud voice. Third angel's message, loud voice. By the way, the term loud voice, megaphona. It's where you get the word megaphone. Mega, big. It's like it's ampli as much amplification as you can have back in Bible times. And, but it doesn't seem like it's given with a loud voice until you get to Revelation 18. And I think we're at that point now. And you know what that message is. Well, we'll get to that in just a minute. I wanna, I'm going to try and give you a sweeping overview of the three angels' messages. I'm trying to put myself in your shoes or for anyone who is watching where I was when I first joined the church and I thought, what is so important about the three angels' message? I know that during the week there's going to be a lot of great presentations that are going to go into this in much more detail. So I just want to sort of give a sweeping overview now that may help set the stage for some of the other presentations. So here, Revelation 13, you've got the great judgment. Revelation 14, you've got the great judgment on those who get the mark. The judgment in chapter 13 on those who refuse the mark. Everyone today, if you talk about the mark of the beast, you kind of get their attention, but they forget that there's another mark. Everybody must be marked. Have you read Ezekiel 9? Talks about a judgment that comes on God's people because they do not have the mark that they are the ones who sigh and cry for the abominations that are done. They're people who are pleading for holiness among God's people. So uh, let's just go through this a little bit. I'm going to start again with Revelation 14:6. I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven. Now it's the first angel. Why does he say another angel if it's the first angel? Well, because it's probably referring back to this angel that you find in Revelation chapter 8, verse 13. It says, I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. So there's lots of angels in Revelation. If you want to count Michael and his angels that are in chapter 12 and the dragon and his angels, John has seen a lot of angels. So that should not surprise us. He's flying in heaven. What does that mean? He's in a position of visibility. He's up high. It's a message that's heard. Jesus, when he wanted to teach the multitudes, it says he went up into the mountain so that the people could hear him. And it was from a mountain that God said, the Mount of Transfiguration, this is my beloved son. And God speaks from heaven. God speaks from mountains. And it's something where he wants everyone to hear. So those angels flying in the midst of heaven is a talking about a message that is to go around the world. When God says he's speaking through an angel, uh, just this week, I, I listened to uh, various Christian radio and uh, I was taking a shower listening. That's too much information. I was listening to a, a Christian radio program and uh, this preacher was talking about these verses. And I got, I was sad and aggravated because I knew a lot of people were listening, but he got it all wrong. It's not a literal angel that's going to be in the heavens. That angel represents God preaches the gospel not so much through angels. Angels empower people. Angels will tell Ananias, go talk to Saul. He's over here praying. Angels tell the people to go. Angels will tell Peter, I want you to go talk to Cornelius. And so these angels in the heaven are basically angels that are empowering people to preach the gospel. The word angel means anglos, it's messenger. So it's a message that goes to the world and it's in the heavens. I think it's interesting that um, satellite right now, 3ABN, they're ricocheting this message off a satellite that's in a geocentric orbit 23,000 miles up in space. And these big satellites have got these wings that are solar panels that capture light so that they can bounce the message back down. And Elon Musk is now setting a whole network 
of satellites, clusters of satellites that are in low orbit that are going to use the internet and make it available to every corner of the earth. That's his goal. And uh, he sometimes misfires, but he's made a lot of things happen. So the message, I believe, is going to go to the whole world. This angel is flying in the midst of heaven. And he's giving that message of that wonderful hope, having the everlasting gospel. Now I could stop right now and do a ten-part series on the everlasting gospel. Time will not permit me to do that. But you know what the gospel is. If you forget anything else I say tonight, that's the most important part because that's what saves you. It's not just the warnings. It's the gospel. The gospel is that God so loved the world that he sent his son into the world for three reasons. Jesus came to show us what God is like. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He came to show us God's love. He came to show us how to live. The Bible says he's given us an example that we should walk even as he walked. So he's our example. He shows us how to love each other, how to forgive. They're on the cross praying for forgiveness for those who murdered him. And then he came as our substitute. He said, I love you so much, I am willing to take what you deserve and give you what I deserve. I will take your weakness and give you my strength. I'll take your, your sin and give you my righteousness. And he takes our wrongness and gives us his righteousness. He makes a complete exchange. He says, I'll walk, you ride, like the parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus trades places with us. And he suffers for our sins so that whoever believes in him, we must cash in on that gift. He says, should not perish but have everlasting life. He loves you so much, he's giving you a way to escape certain wrath unless you are covered by the blood of the lamb, like that Passover lamb that covered the Israelites during that judgment. That's the everlasting good news that you can be born again. And it's all about Jesus. Uh, you know, the more I live, the more important I, it is to me. It's about a personal, walking, day-by-day -day relationship with Jesus. That's the good, the good news, the everlasting gospel. And it tells where it's to go. Just like the beast power is telling everybody, every nation, to bow down, God says, I've got good news. My message is going to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. So Jesus said, Great Commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And he wants the message to go everywhere. And I tell you what, friends, it is so exciting. Um, we've got a lot of evangelists that are here at a program like this that have done a lot of extensive travel, um, both laymen, missionaries, pastors. And uh, we have been blessed to be able to go to a lot of different countries. Karen and I were overseas on a trip when COVID broke out. And we were in Australia when that happened. And... and uh, just, it, it's so exciting. I'll tell you one quick story. I don't even remember what year it was. Three years ago, we were in New Guinea. And um, we wanted to get some footage that looked like the jungle. We were doing some meetings in Mount Hagen. There was like 150,000 people coming to these meetings. And I wish I could say that only happened when I was there, but a lot of the evangelists have crowds like that. These people are hungry for the gospel. So we went out of town. And uh, when driving up off into the bush, up in the jungle, and we had a small camera crew with us, they said, we want to try and get like, uh, something that looks like a hut. So finally I said, boy, that, that's great right there. And they said, got some trees and hut and something in the mountains. And we were way out on dirt roads. It's a dangerous country. We had two armed guards with us, church members with machine guns. It's really strange if you've ever been there. <laughs> that's a deacon's job. So... <laughs> And so our translator jumps out and uh, he says something in pigeon to the proprietors and says, you know, I've got some people here and they want to take some pictures. Is that okay? And she, the lady says, sure. And so we climb out of the car and we walk up and we say hi. And the lady looked like she saw a ghost. And her mouth got big and she was real quiet. And I thought, oh, what did we do? And then she starts to jabber and pigeon to our translator and really excitedly. And he starts telling us what she's saying. She said, I've been watching your program. Now, we're up in the jungle. There's no electricity. This is just way out. And these people are all barefoot. And she says, we watch your program every week. And she said, we never dreamed we'd see you walk into our front yard. 
And she was so excited. We gave her a big hug and we took pictures with her. But the gospel is going everywhere. We've been places where people don't have a house, but they got a cell phone. We were in India a couple of years ago, and our third trip, and driving along. People are, so many poor people, they're living under blue plastic, but they got satellite dishes coming up out of the plastic. I'm serious. It's amazing. So the gospel is going into all the world. Can you say amen? So the, the stuff that we're doing is going far and wide, and it's just so exciting, friends, to know that you're making a difference. So that everlasting gospel goes. What does that uh, angel say? Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to Him. Let's talk about fearing God. There is a message today of reverence for God. There is a message today we should be teaching about the holiness of God. The Bible says, without holiness, no man will see God. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, they will see God. And we need to be telling people, Christ needs to wash you from your sins. And that's not just the outside. He needs to wash the inside of the cup if you want the outside clean. Amen? Amen. And we need to invite the Lord to do that for each one of us and then tell everybody that this is, this is what Jesus does in the new birth. He gives you a new heart. I will create within you. And that means a new mind I will put within you. Yeah. Talking about a reverence for God and a holiness. Fear God and give glory to Him. We need to live lives that are focused on the great priority of bringing glory to God. What is the purpose of our existence? And everything you do, you want to say, Lord, I want to bring glory to you. I was thankful for one of the crew prayed with me just before I walked out. And my prayer was, Lord, whatever I do, I want to glorify you. And he said that in his prayer, and I just took that as God's answer to me. Doug, if that's what you pray for, if that's what you mean, that's what I'll do. And it's not only that we glorify God in what we do and what we say and how we live, our example, how we dress. The Bible says even in what you eat and you drink and whatsoever you do, whether you eat or whether you drink, do all to the glory of God. So yes, part of the three angels' message is people need to glorify God in their bodies and what they eat and they drink. And it makes a difference. We want to honor God. Amen? Fear God and give glory to Him. For the hour of his judgment is come. All right, let's stop there real quick. When this message is going out, it says the hour of his judgment has come. Now, if you read Revelation chapter 2 and 3, you know that there are seven messages to seven churches. Church of Ephesus, the first church, it's going forth with conquering with power, but their danger is they get so involved in doing the work they forget the Lord and they lose their first love. And you can go through the different stages of the church in those seven messages to the seven churches, and you see seven ages of the church. The last age of the church is Laodicea. What does Laodicea mean? Judging of the people. And we entered that last age of the church in 1844. That was a very interesting year. I did a whole study on what happened that year. Got a whole list of things. You can, matter of fact, Amazing Facts just did a whole mag magazine on 1888 and the sanctuary. But I can tell you, friends, that that was a turning point in history. You know what the first electronic message was? It was when uh, Samuel Morse sent a message on the first Morse code, and the message was from Leviticus, and it was, What hath God wrought? First email. If Morse code counts. What hath God wrought? 1844 was that message. It was like the birth of the industrial era. And we enter the last age, which means a judging of the people. It's a time when God is wanting to bring His church back to the faith that was once delivered to the saints. Let me ask you a question. When Jesus comes again, do you think we're going to have the same level of commitment and holiness as the apostles? A little less or a little more? Now, if you were the Lord... Would you want your work among humans on earth to end with a sorry defeat? Would you be up in heaven saying, well, I did pretty good when I came down during Pentecost, but this group in the last generation, they're just sort of wimping out on me, but I better come back before it gets worse. Is Jesus going to be defeated when he brings his redeemed to heaven? Or is God going to do for us what he did for the apostles? He's going to help us experience a revival 
That means I believe the power. You know, miracles comes in waves biblically. I believe we're going to see a wave of power and miracles again in the last days that you haven't seen since apostolic times. And, but you know what's going to come with that is there's got to be holiness. There needs to be a unity. What happened at Pentecost? The disciples were on their knees in one place. They're of one accord. They're of one heart. They'd put aside their differences. They were no longer arguing about which one had the highest position. And when they humbled themselves before God, he could then fill them and lift them up. It may take persecution to get us to that. You know that. But there's going to be, I believe, a big revival. Fear God and give glory to him. The hour of his judgment is come. Now, I never struggled. Maybe I, 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 when I joined the church, they had this big uh, you know, upheaval about the judgment and the sanctuary and did it really happen? And I never had a problem with that coming from the outside because to me it just made perfect sense. I read where Jesus says, the last chapter of the Bible in Revelation 22, Behold, I come and my reward is with me. So that means when Jesus comes, he knows who gets what. You with me? So that means some judgment must take place before he comes. You with me? And Peter said judgment must begin at the house of God. So that tells us where it begins. Ezekiel chapter 9 tells us, begin at my sanctuary. So it's really clear to me that there's some judgment that takes place before he comes. I don't know why that would be a struggle. And he's going to begin with those who have had the greatest opportunity because God loves people and he wants as many as possible to have the most opportunity as possible. The hour of his judgment has come. And you know, I've also learned that you behave differently when you know that you're about to face the judge. I know you'll find this shocking, but I had to go to court once. <laughs> and... Um, the only serious car wreck I ever had, I didn't even have a license. I was like 14. And a uh, friend and I were smoking pot in his parents' Mercedes. And he was letting me drive. And I ran into a parked car because there was so much smoke in the cabin we couldn't see out the windshield. <laughs> and I had to go to court. Now, when I had the accident, I had long hair and torn jeans and looked really rough. It would, that was the look back then. But when I knew I had to come stand before the judge, I went through a complete makeover. <laughs> so why do you think the angels are saying the hour of his judgment is come? Simple terms, he's saying shape up. The judge is coming. And we are all going to be judged. Believe the gospel because there's an hour of judgment. Your only hope to escape the judgment is to believe the gospel. The hour of his judgment has come. Worship him. What's the message in Revelation chapter 13? Worship the beast. What was the big battle between Cain and Abel? How shall we worship? Cain says, I'm going to worship this way. But God said, no, that's not the way to do it. Abel said, we need to worship the way God says. His word matters. Do it the way he says. Cain said, you know, worship, worship. Lamb, artichoke, it doesn't matter. You offer your lamb, I'm going to offer my fruit. And Abel labored with his brother, said, no, but we've got to go back to the word. And Cain said, stop telling me what to do. And Cain got so upset that the one who was wrong killed the one who was right. Was Jesus killed because of his badness or was he killed because of his goodness? His goodness made their badness stand out. They didn't like it. That's the same battle in the last days. They both claim to worship the same God, Cain and Abel. By the way, did Cain get a mark? Yeah. So history is sort of humanity cycling through the same problem again. And the Bible says that Abel offered a lamb before he died and it was accepted by God. No matter what comes, you want to make sure that you've got the blood of the lamb, friends. Amen? Worship him. It's all about worship. What does worship mean? Worthship. It means God is worthy. I mean, you think about it. What right does God have? You know, when I used to, I used to think, God's up there in the sky, and I used to go to Catholic school, and they basically said you gotta love God, or He's gonna burn you forever. 
And that to me sounded a little pushy. <laughs> He's saying, you better love me because I gave my son to die for you. And I thought, well, how many people have sinned? Everybody sinned. So we all kind of have this problem. We were, seems like we're born with it. You're going to now tell us if you don't love me and if you do what you're naturally inclined to do, I'm going to burn you forever. I just found it hard to love God with that concept. But I realized that Jesus didn't want us to sin, that there's been a war. You know, if anything bad happens, everyone says, if God is good, why is he allowing all this? They don't understand what the devil has done. There's a battle over worship. The devil wanted to be worshipped as God. He said, I will be like the most high. This whole battle that we're seeing is a battle over worship. Satan is trying to defame God and to hijack his worship. But when you realize that Jesus said, look, I love you. I made you. You've been hijacked by an evil fiend. But I love you so much, I'm going to die for you to redeem you. I can't make you love me. I hope you'll look at me, find out who I really am, and I trust you will love me then. He has a right to our love and our worship because he is the creator. You ought to trust him for that reason. He said, I've got your best good in mind. We ought to love him and worship him because he's our redeemer. It's like, you know, he created you, then he bought you back. But he made you free. It's your choice. Fear God. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is to depart from evil. That's one of the ways we show fear. Ecclesiastes, speaking about the hour of his judgment and fearing God. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man for God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or evil. That's Solomon saying, let's wrap it all up. Fear God and keep his commandments. But why do we keep his commandments? Jesus said, if you love me, keep his commandments. And John says, his commandments are not grievous. No good thing will God withhold from them that walk uprightly. He, when he asks us to obey him, it's because it's in our best interest because he loves us. The hour of his judgment has come. And worship the creator. Now, when it says worship him, notice what it says. Worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of water. All right, right there it's telling us worship the creator. Now, uh, if you go back a couple hundred years, every nation in the world believed in a God and a creator, all or gods. But now we're believing, or now we're living in a time when so much of the world scoffs at the idea that we were created. But you know, there is sort of a, there's a resurgence trying to come up among even biologists that are saying, it's getting to the point where the science is showing that you can no longer defend life is an accident. There are too many interworking systems. There's too much complex design in a single cell of life. They're, they're getting where this is just really getting hard to believe. And there's like a wave of scientists and stuff that are looking at the data and going, it's really hard to believe that this couldn't happen. Worship him who made. And then it borrows language right from the fourth commandment, the longest commandment in the middle of God's law. For in six days the Lord. Now what commandment is that? The Sabbath. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea. This is exactly what we're reading here. One of the greatest evidences of the creator is the creation. You to me are great evidence of God. You know why? You were made in his image. If you want to know about God, God's got feelings. He gave them to you. God can love and hate. He can be jealous. God can be sad or happy. And God made us in his image. He even gave the original parents the ability to procreate in their own image because we were made in the image of God. And you think of the complexity of design and even the complexity of thought. Just think about it for a minute. I'm up here making all of these noises and somehow your brain is able to decipher all of these noises and through the noises I'm making I'm able to put pictures in your mind and it's a miracle that I'm able to make noises that could be deciphered for you in some intelligent way 
And to think that all of this has all evolved by accident because some gas particles collided billions of years ago, it frankly is absurd. And I used to believe that. I can't believe it anymore. People say, well, it's because you read the Bible. No, I can't believe it because it's just not logical. If God's people had been keeping the Sabbath and preaching the Sabbath the way they were supposed to, in exalting the Creator and looking at His creation every week and talking about His holiness, we would be worshiping Him and there'd be a lot fewer evolutionists and atheists in the world today. That's why He's calling us back to worship the Creator. Do not be embarrassed to tell people that you believe in a Creator God. I, I don't fall for, I get all kinds of interesting conspiracy email. Um, and my secretary, I just want to say hi to Bonnie, who is watching right now back from California. She said, I'm going to write a book someday of the mail that you get. She says, I don't even read it all to you. I mean, I do read a lot of my mail, don't misunderstand, but that just, I won't even, because, you know, if I touch on any conspiracy now, someone out there probably believes it, and I'm going to hurt your feelings. But there's some really strange conspiracies out there, and I think, do you really believe that? You really, I'll pick on one of you. You really believe the earth is flat? I'm sorry. I'm a pilot. My father took me 45,000 feet in a Learjet. The earth is round. And I've flown all around it. North Pole, South Pole, it's round. I promise you it's round. But I probably offended somebody. I'm serious, friends. You look around. <laughs> but I'll tell you, there is a conspiracy I believe in. There is a conspiracy in academia to create a false narrative about the age of the earth and creation. And I remember getting a National Geographic. Someone once bought me a subscription, National Geographic. And... Uh, I liked the photographs and I kept it for years and finally they put out one and they said, is evolution true? And then you turn, turn the page, it says yes. And they didn't go into any answers. And I thought, they got their mind made up. But friends, I believe what God says, that the Lord created the world in six literal 24-hour periods. He's able to do that. And I believe the science even supports that. But there's been a conspiracy to just create this whole different narrative of how everything came into being. Well, let's move right along. This is supposed to be a short overview. <laughs> Worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And then you go to the second angel. He follows saying Babylon is fallen and is fallen. And it talks about Babylon as a, a woman. It identifies her more clearly when you get to Revelation 17. Babylon comprises not only that scarlet harlot, but it's she and her daughters. And it tells us that Babylon is fallen. You get to Revelation 18, it says Babylon is fallen, is fallen with a loud voice. And that's a message that needs to go with a loud voice now. Come out of her. What does a woman represent in prophecy? A church. You've got two women in Revelation. You got a woman in Revelation chapter 12 who is the bride of Christ. She's clothed with the light of God's sun, moon, and stars. You got a woman in Revelation 17. She's clothed with all this earthly gold. It's beautiful, but it's all earthly. It's not the supernatural light. It's counterfeit. All, all of Revelation is contrasting these two, the, the true and the false, you might say. Even a counterfeit trinity there in the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. Babylon has fallen. It fell back when God's people came out back in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. And it's going to fall again. Spiritual Babylon is fallen. And God says, come out of her, my people. I think it's interesting that Abraham got a wife in Mesopotamia, Babylon, brought her to the promised land. But she was uh, barren. It took a miracle for her to have kids. Then he sends a servant back to Mesopotamia to get a wife for Isaac. He brings her out of Babylon into the promised land. Then Jacob, Rachel, I'm sorry, Rebecca and Isaac said, we don't want you to marry one of the local Canaanites like your brother. He goes back to Mesopotamia and he gets more than he bargained for. He gets Rachel and Leah and Bill and Zilpha and brings them out of Mesopotamia back to the promised land. And God's people are carried off to Babylon 
in the time of Jeremiah. And then he calls them out of Babylon because Babylon was going to fall and plagues were going to come on Babylon. And now God has a lot of his people. I'm so glad that God says they're his people. You know, it tells us in the um, book Great Controversy, the greatest part of Christ's true followers are in the fellowship of other denominations. Did you hear me? The greatest part of Christ's true followers are in the fellowship of these other churches that constitute Babylon. They're his people. They need to hear his voice. He said, I stand at the door and I knock. If any man hears my voice. Jesus said, other sheep I have that are not of this fold. John chapter 10. Them also I must call. Why? They're going to come out. There'll be one fold and one shepherd. In the last days, the world is going to be shaken. You can even feel it now. And everyone's going to polarize into one, two group, groups. The world's pretty polarized politically right now. Amen? I don't know what side you're on, but it is polarized. And God is going to call his people into one of two groups. You and I are to be given that message because it's a life and death message in the last days. Come out of Babylon. And then you've got the third angel. You read in Revelation chapter 14, 9 and 10. He followed and he says with a loud voice again, If anyone worships the beast in his image, we need to know who that is. The beast very uh, simply it tells us it's uh, apostate Catholicism, apostate Protestantism, Babylon and her daughters, people who have taken the name of Christ, seven women in that day will take hold of one man saying we'll eat our own bread and we'll wear our own apparel, but we want your name to take away our reproach, Isaiah chapter 4. That's where we are right now, all these different denominations and there's some good people out there, but they got their own idea, eat our own bread, own idea of righteousness, but they call themselves Christians. Christian right now, largest religion in the world. That doesn't excite me because most of the people that take the name of Christ really don't know Jesus. He wants them to know him. How's that going to happen? We need to give the three angels messages to the world, friends. Amen? And then comes the most fearful pronunciation. It tells us he'll, they'll, he'll pour out the wine of the wrath of God. You read about that in Revelation 15. And 16, seven last plagues, great tribulation, such as no man has ever had, which is poured out full strength, it's not diluted, unmitigated wrath of God, into the cup of his indignation. You know, if you're drinking the wine of Babylon, you get the wine of God's wrath. You got the wrath of the beast, you got the wrath of God. You just got to picture which wrath you want. I'd rather be on God's side, friends, Amen. It's poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation and he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. Now listen carefully. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever and they have no rest. God's people have rest. Jesus says, come unto me and I'll give you rest. Those who worship the beast in his image have no rest. Not only is there a rest that the Sabbath is a symbol of, but we have a very real rest in Christ. That's every day in Jesus. Amen? They have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image or whoever receives the mark of his name. What does that mean? He's quoting from the Old Testament. If you want to know what they mean about the smoke of his torment, this is the number one verse that many people turn to to talk about an ever-burning hell. Let the Bible explain itself. You look in Isaiah 34 talking about the destruction on the land of Edom. Verse 9 and 10, its streams will be turned into pitch and its loose earth into brimstone and its land will become burning pitch. It will not be quenched day or night. Its smoke will go up forever. Now here's a question. Was Edom judged? Yes. Is it still burning? No. Saying the smoke will go up forever and what the smoke did, it lasts forever. Doesn't mean we're going to be outside the New Jerusalem are sitting on the walls and watching the wicked burn and all the smoke ascending forever and ever. I mean, uh, do you think God would like that? The Bible says he's making a world where there's no more pain, no more sorrow, no more suffering. Tells us that the punishment of the wicked is going to be like the punishment of Sodom and Gomorrah. The wicked will perish into smoke. They will vanish away. What did Abraham see above Sodom and Gomorrah? The land went up like the smoke of a furnace in Genesis 19. Are Sodom and Gomorrah still burning? No. 
Peter says, they are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Jude says, turning them into ashes. They're gone. This is talking about the permanent, forever annihilation of the wicked after every man receives punishment according to his works. That's also in Revelation. So this is the most powerful warning. And it describes those then, contrasting those who have the mark of the beast with those who worship the image. And it says here, Revelation 14, 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. It says that three times in Revelation. Revelation 12, 17, dragon is wroth with the woman that keeps the commandments of God and has the testimony of Jesus. Revelation chapter 22, verse 14, blessed are those who do his commandments that they might enter through the gates of the city and eat from the tree of life. It's talking about wonderful reward, terrible judgment. There's nothing in between, friends. The only thing that can save us from the terrible judgment is Jesus. Amen? Amen. The world needs this warning. I remember reading in Reader's Digest years ago about a man driving some terrible stormy night. It was dark. His windshield wipers were on full blast. And off in the distance, he saw someone wandering in the road. And he thought, I'm going to run them over. And he tried to get out of the way. He realized that they were coming towards him in the middle of the road. And someone drunk. And he tried to swerve around them. And they kept getting in the lane that he was in. He slowed down. And he thought, I'm going to speed up and drive around this maniac. And he changed lanes at the last minute to drive around the guy. He threw himself in front of the car. The man, who happened to be a pastor, jumped out said, are you out of your mind? You wanting me to kill you? And the man was sobbing. He said, the bridge is out. The bridge is out. I've seen several vehicles in a bus drive over the bridge and the people have died. I couldn't stand to see another person be lost. He was ready to lay down his life to give that warning. My oh, friends, I tell you what, the bridge is out. The only way is the cross of Christ that stands there as an obstacle to our own destruction. And Jesus is wanting us to let people know there's only one way. We all need to put ourselves in that path. Be willing to say, Lord, I'm yours. Here I am. Send me. Is that your desire? Share the good news that they can have everlasting life through Christ, a world with no more pain and suffering. Can I pray with you? Father in heaven, this is the present truth for today. This is the message the world needs to hear. There is no more concentrated truth anywhere in Scripture, Lord. And I pray that you'll be with each person here. Help us know how through our lives, through our ministries, to share the everlasting gospel with the world that is perishing. That you are a loving God. That we should reverence you and worship you with everything we do and everything we say. I pray you bless this convention. May your spirit rest upon it and everything that happens here. May we glorify you in our words and our lives. And if anyone has not given their heart to Jesus, may they embrace him now. We pray and thank you in Jesus' name.